know, as a child in a reality life, you look forward to those celebrations, your birthday, first day of school, whatever religious holiday you have, 4th of July, first day of camp, if you get to go to camp. Like these are joyful, sometimes a little scary um, moments, but you're still thinking about it. It's active in your imagination, in your mind. Your beginning as a young child to go, oh, I wonder who my teacher is going to be. And so I hope they I hope they feel like I see them and that they have a voice because that's what these books are created to do to show a child that they they have a voice that we are seeing and listening and hearing them and identifying and trying to help them identify with feelings and excitement and trepidation about their life not ours. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Bianca Schultz from the Children's Book Review, and this is the Growing Readers Podcast. Today's guest is an absolute icon. She's an author, actor, activist, sister, friend, wife, and mother. It's none other than the fabulous Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie is well known as a film actor, starring in such acclaimed films as Beverly Hills Chihuahua, Freaky Friday, True Lies, Trading Places, A Fish Called Wanda, and most recently, Everything Everywhere All at Once, for which she won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. Jamie is also the New York Times bestselling author of numerous picture books, including Tell Me Again About the Night I Was Born, Today I Feel Silly, I'm Gonna Like Me, and My Brave Year of Firsts. Laura Cornell illustrates all of Jamie's children's books, and they address core childhood subjects and life lessons in a playful, accessible way. Jamie finds the inspiration for her writing all around her, in the experiences of her children, her godchildren, her friends, and of course, in her own life. Today, she's also going to share a little bit about her newest title, Just One More Sleep. All good things come to those who wait and wait and wait. Before I share our conversation, here's the synopsis. In a celebration of delayed gratification, New York Times best-selling duo Jamie Lee Curtis and Laura Cornell give readers a new self-help book for kids that explains why waiting can be wonderful and can give you a reason to cheer all year round from New Year's Day to Kwanzaa and all the holidays in between. Just one more sleep. Waiting is not easy especially for children. Often, they measure the concept of time in how many more sleeps until the exciting day comes. When there is so much to do, so many exciting things to explore, and so many holidays to celebrate. In a buoyant book that channels childhood exuberance, Jamie Lee Curtis makes it clear why waiting is worth it. And with Laura Cornell's bold and humorous artwork helping readers celebrate and appreciate milestones throughout the year, this is a story worth waiting for. And one kids will want to read over and over again. Hello, Jamie Lee Curtis. Thank you so much for coming on the Growing Readers Podcast. I well, have literally... I love being here. I love the idea. I love the title of your podcast, Growing Readers. Thank you. I've been counting down the sleeps, although last night I was so excited. I think it took me a little while to fall asleep. For children, you know, it's a book about waiting. And yes, as you said, it's like the countdown to Christmas, but how many of us have 
had difficulty falling asleep before a big event, Christmas, a birthday, you know, it, it, it's, it's a beautiful way of, of metabolizing time for young children. Um, and I'm lucky that my little neighbor, Betty, uh, said it to me three years ago, uh, or I wouldn't have a book today. Oh my gosh. So we have Betty to thank for this wonderful title. Yes. Um, well, just, just for your listeners, here's the story. It's brief. It was COVID. We were in lockdown. It was the first year, 2020. It was the first Christmas during COVID. We were all at our homes. Um, and I went out on the street to get my mail and I was wearing a mask and Betty and her mom, Whitney, were down the street, uh, like 10 feet away. And I waved, Hey, Betty. Hi, Jamie. And I said, Hey, Betty. It's, it was Christmas Eve. And I said, Hey, Betty, Santa's on his way. And she said to me, no, Jamie, no, uh-uh. One more sleep, then Santa. And I realized in that instant that children, of course, compartmentalize time through how many sleeps they have. And of course, I felt like I had made a mistake because a young child doesn't understand that Santa is in the air and, you know what I mean, the time that it's already daytime in another country. Like the idea of time is, is so amorphous for a child and sleep makes it concrete. And so that's how the book was born. I love that. Well, and for me too, I think one of the most crucial elements of just existing is actually sleeping. If we don't get enough sleep, I just think <laughs> then like, even if you've waited for these, those fabulous moments to come, your birthday, your Christmas, if you're tired, then you don't get to enjoy it too. So anyway, I just love the whole concept of sleep and counting down the sleeps. I also just need to take a quick segue because I can't go on without congratulating you on your Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Your acceptance speech, I felt that in my entire body, the, the mm -hmm. whole idea of I might look like I'm standing here alone, but really you're standing on the shoulders of others. I mean, I think I started in a crying. group of people. You know, it's the idea is that it's a collaborative art form. Um, being an actor is a collaborative art form. Movies are collaborative. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And just watch any movie and look at the credits. Um, there are hundreds of people involved, not just the you know nucleus of the creativity, usually the writer, director, producer, actors, and the camera crew and the sound crew and the costuming crew. Like, it's just an enormous group of people. And in that instance, the idea that I was being somehow celebrated was incorrect because I don't exist without the writers. I don't exist without the directors, the costumer, the makeup, like I don't exist without my scene partners. That creation of that per woman doesn't exist. Um, and so I appreciate that, that you saw that. I will tell you it was a, certainly a big surprise for me that it all happened. And I, I'm glad that that moment resonated for you because it resonated for me <laughs> in a very big way. That's amazing. Well, let's let's carry on with that message of collaboration because, yes, you're this amazing, celebrated actor, actress, but you're also a best-selling author. All of your children's books have been bestsellers. So let's talk about that collaborative process and what does that look like for you when you're creating your children's books? There's a John Steinbeck quote uh, from East of Eden about creation, about creativity. And what he posits, and I've, you know, is that nothing is created by two people. Creation is comes from what he refers to as the individual mind of the man uh, or woman or human that creation comes from one person's idea and immediately can get built on by other people and expanded and stretched and but 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 nothing is created in that instant by two and so from that idea the idea of creation is thrilling to me so 
the books that I write come from children, mostly. They come from phrases like the first book I wrote was called When I Was a Little, a Four-Year-Old's Memoir of Her Youth. And it was born when my then four-year-old daughter, Annie, marched into my office. I remember where I was sitting. Um, and she marched in and kind of put her hands on her hips in that very cute way that children do. And she was like, when I was little, I wore diapers, but now I use a potty. And then she started to laugh and then ran out of the room. And I, there was a pad. I keep a, like a journal-y kind of pad thing on my desk, but there was a pad on my desk and I wrote down on a pad, I wrote, when I was a little, a four-year-old memoir of her youth, because it just made me laugh. And then I wrote, like, when I was little, I did this, but now I do this. And I wrote it all. And at the end of it, I wrote three things that made me cry. And I started to cry. I wrote, when I was little, I didn't know what a family was. When I was little, I didn't know what dreams were. When I was little, I didn't know who I was, but now I do. And the minute I wrote, now I do, I realized that she had her own life. She had a history. She was talking about the good old days when she was little. The way I talk about like wearing bell bottoms and, and corkies and having a shag, like the good old days, you know? And it made me understand that she had identity, but she was four. And as far as I was concerned, she was just this little kid, but it was so clear that she understood she had an identity and that it was hers. And I, in that moment, went, oh, this is a book for children. And I sent it to a public, a, 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 an agent. I didn't have an agent. I sent it to my mother-in-law's best friend. She, through fax, she then sent it to Joanna Kotler, who was the head of children's books at Harper and Row. That's how old I am. <laughs> and they bought it that day. And that's how I began writing books for children. I had never thought of it. The reason that we sent it to Harper and Row was because they had published a book by a wonderful author named Leah Kamiko. And it was a book called Annie Banani. And my daughter, Annie, was given that book. And I recited that book to Annie every day until she was four. And I realized that I loved the illustrations. I loved the way she, Laura Cornell, looked at the world. And she had drawn that book. And I sent it to my agent, my mother-in-law's best friend, Phyllis Wender. And I said, can you send it to, I don't think I even knew the word publisher. I think I said, can you send it to the place that made the book Annie Banani, which at that time was Harper and Row. So you see, it all began with Laura Cornell. I, she sees the world the way I see the world. Nothing, I do not see the world through an Instagram filter. I do not see the world through a Pinterest page. I see the world in reality. Kids have scraped knees. Their, you know, their um, pony, their pigtails are often askew. There's always a hair missing. There's a tooth missing. That's who we are. We are imperfect humans. And she draws imperfect humans in the joy of life. And so I, that's how we became partners. They bought the book. They partnered me with her and we've made a bunch of books since then. I love that kind of magic collaboration that you obviously have with her. I, I, I So people that listen to this podcast know that a lot of times authors don't actually meet their illustrators, um, but some do. So I'm curious, have you and Laura hung out in, in the real world? So Laura and I have made, I think we made like 14 books together. Um, we've met probably five times. She lives in New York, a single mother. She's an artist, a little zany. Um, I am a type A mother of two, married, good girl from Los Angeles, um, who happens to be an actor, um, very organized, like hyper-organized. And we are just a good, weird pair. She brings the humor. I bring the pathos. 
my secret sauce of my books is that they there are two things and it's crucial for your listeners. How many of us as parents have read books for children and we just are bored? We are bored by the book. We're just bored. The kid may be delighted by the book, which is the point. But you see, they are supposed to be read by adults to children. It's very important to remember that. So from the beginning, when I was little, a four-year-old's memoir of her youth is funny for a parent, for an adult, thinking that a four-year-old has a, is writing a memoir, <laughs> you know, like a tell-all. Yeah. You know, it's just funny. And so all of my books have this duality. There's a book for children and there's a book for an adult. So all of the subtitles, Today I Feel Silly, and other moods that make my day. Make my day is Clint Eastwood's like catch. Yeah, go ahead. And make my day. Dirty Harry. So you see the duality of that. It's a book for children about moods and feelings. And I've thrown in a little subversive darkness, which is for adults. So what happens is adults really like reading my books because they're stuff in it for them. The best example is in the book, Where Do Balloons Go? An Uplifting Mystery, which was born at a children's birthday party when all of the party favors, which were the helium balloons, got let loose. They were tied to a pole. A kid pulled the string. They all flew up in the sky. We all went, oh. We looked up in the sky and a little girl named Rachel Evans standing next to me at this park pulled on her mommy's sweater and said, mommy, where do balloons go? <laughs> and in that second, I went, oh, what? And wrote a book. But in that book, it's a book about what happens when we've all done it, let go of the balloon, it goes up to the sky, and we wonder. And this little child asks his parents, like, where do balloons go? And it's done in rhyme. And at one point it says, where do they go when they float far away? Do they ever catch cold, need somewhere to stay? Now, that's a beautiful idea of a child being worried that that balloon is going to be cold and maybe sick and not have a place, warm place to go. But where the balloon goes in the dream, in the illustration is the Bates Motel. Now, Anybody listening to this understands that the reference to the Bates Motel is the movie Psycho that my mother, Janet Lee, um, uh, met her grisly end in. Now, again, this is a book for children. So the line of music for the child is very warm and loving and concerned. Does it ever catch cold, need somewhere to stay? And then, of course, for the adult, there's this joyful illustration of this balloon kind of floating near the Bates Motel. It just makes you laugh a little. And in that, you then engage the parent in a way that is thrilling for them because then they're looking for the sort of parent messages. They're like secret messages embedded in a book for children. So that's my secret sauce yes. that um, I think has made my book so successful. I know that you're a bit of an activist. You're you're outspoken. I love seeing, you know, some of the things you talk about online. So we know that the world is a little bit topsy-turvy at times. And I'm just curious in sort of just where we at with things going on in the world. Is there something specific that motivates you or, you know, keeps you driven towards creating books for for children. I know a lot of times people get the ideas when their kids are are younger and you're inspired by these things that your kids say and and that's that that may be all it is. But I think sometimes like if we think about it in a deeper level is there is there something else that motivates and drives us for for writing for kids? So, here's what I would say. I think the world is hard. I think being human is hard and contradictory. 
And I think being a child is hard. I wrote a book called, It's Hard to Be Five, Learning How to Work My Control Panel. I, I didn't write a book saying, it's easy to be five. I wrote a book called, It's Hard to Be Five, because I recognize that by five, you're starting to pick up some bigger cues around the world. We are starting to ask kids to sit still and listen and learn. And it's a, it's a tough time. So, but to that point, I think life is hard. You know, it's the line from The Princess Bride, uh, which I love, which is when Princess Buttercup um, finds out that uh, Wesley, her love, has been killed. And the man in black at the top of the cliff says something about Wesley. And she says, you mock my pain. And Wesley looks at her and says, life is pain, Highness. And anyone who says differently is selling something. That's true. Life is pain. Life is hard and joyful. And the metabolizing of both ideas is what maturity is. The more we mature, we, we can live with the disparity of life. That there are atrocities happening everywhere, not just in the Middle East, not just in um, North Korea, but in our backyards and in our homes. And so the metabolizing of reality is to me what the definition of maturity is. And I think we do a disservice to children if we don't bring them along in a, a little dose of reality as we make books. So for instance, I made a book years ago, my, 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 my blockbuster, I had a blockbuster book um, called um, Today I Feel Silly and Other Moods That Make My Day. But in that book, we talk about feeling sad and feeling angry and feeling scared. And those are ideas that kids have. And we don't give voice to them in books very often, except in very dark fairy tales, which terrify me. So the idea that our uh, we have generations who were indoctrinated on fairy tales that are gruesome and awful. And yet I'm simply trying to introduce reality to young people. And so in that sense, I do think it's a responsibility, um, but I don't write books to do that. I, I ended up, it turns out, writing what they called self-help books for children because I talked about real things, um, um, self-identity, a book about adoption, how families are built through adoption. Today, I feel silly about moods and feelings, um, self-esteem, loss and letting go. The balloon book is about letting go of, of a balloon, but it's also about loss. And little children deal with loss all the time, either a grandparent or a pet or, God forbid, a friend. Or, if, you know what I mean? Like they, loss is real. And so these books are written not as like, I'm going to write a book about loss. I didn't think about it for a second until I was writing it. And when I wrote the line, you know, because it's about a balloon going farther and farther away. There's a, a line in the book where it says about it going to that place up above. You know, when we lose someone, we look up, we, we somehow we want their presence to be here. And there's a line in the book that says, does it float there forever, remembering me and know that I'm happy that it's floating free? That's helpful for a child. It's helpful for me saying it. I've lost a lot. That's a big idea. And it's couched in a book of wonder and adventure, but the truth is it's a book about loss. And I didn't know that when I wrote it. When I started writing it, it was an adventure book. Where do balloons go when you let them go free? It can happen by accident. It's happened to me. Where do they go when they float far away? 
Do they ever catch cold, need somewhere to stay? Do they keep going up? Do they ever just pop? I'm sure that they're always concerned. No. Uh, do they keep going up? Do they ever just stop? I'm sure that they're always concerned that they'll pop. You know, and then it goes on to tell the story about the balloon. But at the end of it, I'm writing this and all of a sudden I start to cry. You see, for me, starting to cry is an indicator I'm in the book. Yeah. I'm in a Jamie book. Like I'm now in the right zone. When I wrote, when I was little, a four-year-old memoir of her youth, I thought it was just funny things that my little girl couldn't do and now she could do until I got to the end. And I wrote, when I was little, I didn't know what a family was. When I was little, I didn't know what dreams were. When I was little, I didn't know who I was. And now I do. And I started to cry. And it was at that moment that I went, oh, this is a book. So for me, emotion is real. And that's crucial to me in the contract of being an author for children is that you give them something real. Absolutely. I, I just, yeah, you, you need to be able to have a feeling when you end a book, whether it's joy, whether it's, you know, contemplation, you need to be left with a feeling. All right. Well, I want to know this, this book, Just One More Sleep is so joyful. It's about all the holidays in the world. Um, I just, I'm, I'm just Not so all curious. Of them. I wish, yeah, sorry, I wish, yes, correction. I wish I could add all of the holidays. <laughs> lo yes, I'm a sure lot. there will be some people whose holidays I did not mention who are going to feel slighted. Please understand it was impossible to include every holiday. Um, we, we got a lot of them in. Um, uh, it's a big, diverse family with all sorts of, of um, family traditions. But yes, I, I'm, I, we were not able to get them all in, but a lot of them. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't want to give a spoiler away here, but there's no, um, there's no National Hot Dog Day included for uh -huh. anybody that was curious about that. <laughs> well, I, I love, I loved the just the the whole celebration. We've got Passover, Christmas, Kwanzaa, Father's Day, birthdays. It is very, very joyful. So, on that note, what impact do you hope that just one more sleep has on readers? I hope kids like it. I hope kids like it. I hope they feel like, oh, wow, yeah. Oh, that's funny. You know, I, it's funny um, in, in the book. I hope that the, the Publishers Weekly, like in October, did a review of the book calling it uh, a joyous celebration of celebration. And, you know, that's what, you know, as a child in a reality life, you look forward to those celebrations, your birthday, first day of school, whatever religious holiday you have, 4th of July, first day of camp, if you get to go to camp. Like these are joyful, sometimes a little scary um, moments, but you're still thinking about it. It's active in your imagination, in your mind, your beginning as a young child to go, oh, I wonder who my teacher is going to be. And so I hope they I hope they feel like I see them and that they have a voice because that's what these books are created to do to show a child that they they have a voice that we are seeing and listening and hearing them and identifying and trying to help them identify with feelings and excitement and trepidation about their life, not ours. This isn't about me. This is about Betty and her year of waiting for things to happen. And um, and it's a privilege for me to be able to be a writer for books for children that has nothing to do with my public life, has nothing to do with my, you know, my. it's just my ideas and my way I look at the world and look at people. And so it's a privilege for me to be able to be here with you talking about this book. Just one more sleep. Good things come to those who wait and wait. And um, I love it. Jamie, just one more sleep does such a beautiful job of addressing the importance of savoring moments and finding joy in anticipation. 
and even in a world that often encourages immediate satisfaction. So the concept of measuring time in sleeps is completely completely charming. It's very relatable. I don't think just for the children, I think for the adults too, I measure time in sleeps. Yeah. So thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you to Laura for, for the beautiful illustrations. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Stay safe out there. Enjoy, enjoy each day. Thank you so much for joining us on this quest for growing readers. Be sure to check out our show notes. You'll find links to order copies of Just One More Sleep by Jamie Lee Curtis and Laura Cornell. You can follow Jamie on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Jamie Lee Curtis. And remember, if you love listening to the Growing Readers podcast, you can hear it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you enjoy listening. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform to get new episodes as soon as they launch. If you're enjoying our book chats, please leave us a review. And while you're at it, tell a friend to come and have a listen. The Growing Readers Podcast is a production of the Children's Book Review. To find more books like Just One More Sleep, I hope you'll visit us at thechildrensbookreview.com.